Ja, schönen guten Morgen, meine Seele. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear me and understand me? Thank you for this kind introduction. I did not even know what <laughs> a lot of things you know about me. We are short of time, and so please let me switch to the subject right away. In politics, you may be mistaken very often by choosing big terms, but the time of a change of an era or a new era, it's all is very important. And many things which led us to this term, to using these terms, has started already years ago. But the present uh, um, situation, covering uh, being covered by at least five terms, do justify the term of speaking of a change of an era. So my impression is that in spite of the meanwhile famous speech of the German Chancellor after the Russian aggression started against Ukraine, many people are also using this term as a speaker, but my impression is that politics does not explain too much what is behind that term. And astonishingly, a wide audience in Germany does not even understand the consequences of these terms, and they even ignored learning about this. Sometimes you have the impression that there is a war going on in Ukraine, and we have a lot of, a lot of other shifts of um, the world politics, especially in Russia, but in further parts of Germany and maybe even in Western Europe, people think they can just continue as before. And when you ask myself, when you ask me what justifies using that term, I will give you five different justifications. First of all, we have to deal with an implosion of German security architecture. And secondly, we have to deal with the replacement of, a geo of an economic uh, raison d'etre by a geopolitical raison d'etre again. And thirdly, the definition of the neoliberal era is coming to an end. And fourth, we have to deal with a very depressing renaissance of um, uh, autocratic structures, not only outside Europe, but also, as we know in the meantime, also within Europe and even within the European Union. And fifth, not only, not last but least, <laughs> we have to deal with uh, climate change, which is, has a long way to go, but the question still arises whether in the 30s of this century we might come to a tipping point in the climate change. Now let me also elaborate a little bit on that. The collapse of the German security architecture is obvious. It may be that the West has made considerable diplomatic errors in the dealing with Russia, but this doesn't change the, uh, the situation that Russia was the aggressor in this war, and in many ways they violated international law. They, we have to deal with um, war crimes, and it's obvious also that the Russian of Putia, Putin is now uh, driven by uh, an imperial obsession which uh, may lead to the fact that in some days from now, this year will come, will enter the second year. And I would also contradict the guest you will have uh, this afternoon, namely Sarah Wagenknecht, and I, really, I will vividly oppose her opinion that uh, she says that uh, after the many errors in diplomacy of the West, this caused uh, the situation and now at the detriment of uh, Western politics. But Putin does not just want to put in practice his imperial obsessions and come back to the old Soviet um, empire. Automatically, he also is symbolizing this so-called, uh, the fight against the so-called normative system of the West. So his uh, politics is definitely also oriented against Europe and the West in particular, and so it has to be taken very seriously. The possibility of such implosion of European security architecture has least been seen in Germany. And that is why the wake-up call in Germany also was the loudest. Secondly, as I said, we have to deal with a change from a geo-economic raison d'etre to a rather power politics point of view. In more than one and a half decades, the impression was that global politics, apart from the systems, was determined by a far-reaching and further uh, developing globalization, 
networking among countries, exchange and trade, totally um, uh, separate from uh, political differences. But now we find that for a long time already there was a return to a power politics where geopolitics come to the foreground again and suppress geoeconomic ideas. Not only when looking at uh, what um, China started with the Belt and Road Initiative some decades ago, ago and also their claim to um, be leading in and independent in many technological, te technological fields, but America First was also an expression of that change and the present um, efforts uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act also expressed this view and uh, Let's be serious, let's be honest, the Europeans are behaving the same way. And the same, even in, a, in an earlier imperial power like Great Britain, which now is also talk, using terms of global Britain. So we have to deal with something which after the implosion of so, uh, the Soviet Union was thought to be impossible, namely its uh, returning s conflict of systems and the formation of blocks where power, political, calculations play an increasing role and uh, increasingly independence in raw material supplies and um, ch delivery chains or supply chains also are affecting us during the last um, years, especially when looking at the supply difficulties in the course of uh, Chinese efforts and also as a consequence of the aggression of Russia in Ukraine. So in the future we might see a rebirth of a very sharp conflict of systems in the world, which still may be dividing the world into uh, three parts, uh, with um, maybe two or three, with a neutral part in the middle, and a part of this block formation will pose a lot of um, challenges to Europe in order to find its place. The end of the neoliberal era is also founded in the fact that we do not just start with uh, what we have now on our developing by inflation and pandemics, but it was also started already during the financial crisis and at that time I was the Minister of Finance of Germany and we since then have de seen a lot of developments which at least underpin the power ideology and uh, put it um, to the absurd. And I'm not uh, saying that now uh, the opposite has occurred, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that the under the impression of the financial crisis, the euro crisis, the COVID pandemic, inflation. We see also a return of industrial politics against the background of um, system competition. And all of a sudden the relationship between uh, the government and the market uh, is newly defined. And the, you come to the out and result that security, not only in, the means, in this military sense, but also social security, the assurance of infrastructure, the education, promotion of technology and research and development is newly defining the relationship between the market and government and out of a so-called exclusive look to the market we are now are seeing a rather a more understanding of the relationship between market and the government. I think there is no need to speak about the importance of climate change. At least we are lagging behind the needs to do something across borders in that respect. And everybody knows that when looking at the effects of climate change, the global tensions will certainly be increasing. Just think of a migration movement or a further division of the world between poor and rich and also the linked political tensions. The renaissance of bureaucratic and authoritarian structures indeed is now also coming to Europe. The interaction of European institutions, last but not least, is very difficult due to vetoing positions uh, adopted by countries such as Poland and Hungary, which in the meantime have developed a somewhat different relationship to the rule of law and also what we understand by a parliamentary uh, democracy. That means that even in Europe we have to deal with those problems, apart from the fact that right-wing populist and right-wing radical parties recognizably are gaining ground in Germany, but not only in Germany, and even in countries which are classic uh, Nordic democracies, and we have thought, we have thought so long that we have, a, it's almost a paradigmatic understanding, but when we see the last elections in Sweden, and uh, where 
was the right-wing populists took power. In, thanks God, the last uh, presidential elections in France again were decided in favor of Manuel Macron and in Germany too, at least in some states of Germany, the rise of the so-called alternative for Germany in the meantime is, which is a clearly a uh, right-wing radical party, uh, is of course coming with a lot of concerns still for many people. All this justifies to speak about this uh, term change of an era. So for Europe, uh, this brings along um, special difficulties, especially when we look at the um, conflict uh, between the um, Americans and China, if that is going to develop and increasingly focus, um, where the Americans are increasingly focusing on the Asian Pacific area, understandably, the Americans will make, um, will demand more efforts from Europe for its independence. And this uh, especially is true for Germany, which for decades has very comfortably uh, arranged itself under the protection of the Americans. Partly it was uh, rather uh, Hippocratic, where on the one side American presence worldwide, especially military presence, was rather criticized uh, and even hardly critical or hard. But on the other hand, we were very grateful that the Seventh uh, Fleet was uh, present in the, at the coast of uh, Europe and during the Balkan Wars, the Americans intervened, and also that when fighting against uh, ISIS, mainly the, the, the war was waged by the Americans, or at least it was the Americans who ensured a better status quo. And the same goes now for the necessary supplies to Ukraine with the weapons and systems they need in order to resist the aggression. This hypocrisy will some, be something which Germany cannot afford anymore, and it will be a task of German politics um, to bring this home to a wide German audience and which have rather ignored this uh, fact for many times, for many uh, years. So that means that uh, Europe has to take more responsibility for its own security in the future. This is one of the consequences from this change of an era, which I mentioned at the beginning. There is a lot of debating about that, and even in Germany, that uh, caused some rethinking. Just think of the the, 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 the speech of uh, Schol um, the German Chancellor Scholz when he announced the 100 billion fund for the um, rearmament of the Bundeswehr, but it takes a lot of time. And whether people have learned the, their lessons already is coming with a big question mark to me. So at least from the point of view of the larger member states, Europe is um, not uh, coping with any of the challenges as a standalone area, even though in a uh, look at the tectonic um, changes in the global uh, scene, um, they will not only be unable to cope with the challenges of uh, their security, but also in the energy market. And thirdly, when looking at a, a union of banks and capital, that might look uh, very technocratical for you, but it plays an enormous role. Just think of the fact how much capital needs to be mobilized in Europe in order to ensure climate protection through, through an um, energy transition in the next decade. This is not only going to be public money, but they will have to mobilize private investments at uh, billions of uh, euros in order to cope with this uh, kind of industrial revolution which the energy transition means. When looking at the rather weak European banking sector, which uh, still is um, shaped uh, and, and coping, uh, having a, to do with a lot of in, international barriers, as compared with um, Asian banks or American banks, not only the German, but uh, I would even say the European banking system is not robust enough, not profitable enough, and it is transferring the existing capital not to the means which we actually need in order to um, have the widest um, development of uh, public infrastructure, which also would include uh, energy supply. And so it is rather, um, <coughs> or rather large term of a banking union and uh, man monetary union would actually have to play a central role in 
coping with the situation. And this also goes for digitization. When we look at mm, Europe presently, Europe is uh, mainly depending on the big and, um, uh, tech giants in the US. And as a consequence of that, also from Chinese regardless of what the development is going to be uh, with certain barriers which might be put up uh, export sanctions especially in chip manufacturer and some other measures which have been taken but Europe does not have any um, entrepreneurial landscape and does not have the digital capabilities which might encounter this challenge that is why the European digital sovereignty is not a wrong term it's a true, it's a correct term, but actually no one knows what should be understood by this term. However, it doesn't change that Europe in the field of digitization has to recover up, not only in application up to the use in administration, but also when looking at the um, providers of certain technology and service services. We are lagging behind by decades. In Germany, this uh, became obvious, especially during the COVID pandemic, when we found out that the German health system, which is actually a very good system in many fields and is just superior of um, other European systems, at least that is what my British and Italian colleagues told me. But in the field of digitalization of the healthcare sector, during the pandemic, we could see that partly we were still at the level of the 19th century. That's the fourth challenge for Europe. And the fifth challenge for Europe is, in order to cope with this change of an era, is that we should build up a unified taxation system in Europe. The taxation system in Europe is fundamentally uh, different across the uh, European country. And as a former Minister of Finance, I of course know how difficult it is to interfere with the sovereignty of budgetary law in different European countries. But that doesn't change the situation that we need more harmonization of taxation uh, for direct both and indirect um, taxes. And also when looking to the EU budget, we should agree much more um, which priorities uh, should uh, uh, be, for which priorities the money generated by these taxes should be used. And it plays, of course, a very important role, just to come to the last but one point to stabilize the eurozone further. The trend which can be seen in some countries that under the influence, uh, under, under, the, under the euro they have suffered uh, more, especially under the dominance of French and German influence, can't be answered uh, by with a solution to just uh, look at a trend of a renationalization of the euro. I would say that uh, a renationalization of the euro would come uh, with so difficult economic uh, uh, damages and social uh, detriments that this would uh, make it very difficult to keep stability of the eurozone. Germany will have to contribute to the stabilizations and especially also when not like some years ago, Greece is coming into troubled waters, but also for the case that a much stronger and larger European member state of the Eurozone may come into such troubled waters. That does not mean that uh, I'm satisfied with the politics of the European Central Bank of the two, last two years. I think that they really have underestimated the inflation development and they very late, at a very late stage, started to uh, to turn around the interest uh, rates system, and now they are in a dilemma, which can, of course, be very explosive within the European Union. The European Central Bank, giving the need of increasing the interest rate further, will also, as a consequence of the interest politics of the of Fed, will have to make sure that refinancing of highly indebted uh, European member states will not suffer uh, and suffocate those countries. I'm not even talking about Greece right now. Italy, with 150% of its uh, annual GDP, is indebted at that level. 
France is indebted up to 100 110% of its annual GDP. That means you can just do the math. When the European Central Bank raises interest rates too fast and too high in fighting inflation, what it means for refinancing of the debt of those countries. The other way around, however, the European Central Bank is under the pressure of having to continue its way of fighting inflation because a stable currency is the only mandate, the really only mandate of the European Central Bank. And in that dilemma, that is where the Central Bank is right now. That is another challenge before coming to the final one, which is that the current rules of cooperation within the European institutions need uh, urgently to be reformed. The principle of unanimity in many matters is a hindrance to advance for Europe. This principle of unanimity can only be uh, dissolved and revised by a change of the European agreements. But any change of European agreements again requires unanimous agreement of all member states. In particular, a, a par ratification by parliament and in many cases also a referendum. And uh, as the situation is, this will hardly be to be managed. So we are actually uh, standing against the wall. So that means that we have to find a solution below changing the level of changing the European agreements to find a solution and to, co to strengthen cooperation inside Europe. Also when looking at those countries who so, so far have used their vetoing position in the past. And the only way to, let me say, to convince those people not to use their vetoing position is money. <laughs> and so I would wish that the European Commission would make use of that means much stronger than it's uh, being done now. That means um, in facing uh, Hungary and also against the background, not only by violating rule of law, but also the corruption relationships, and the same goes for Poland. I'm not really being, mm, hiding that fact either. So, ladies and gentlemen, those are the central six or seven tasks which I wanted to highlight in this shortness of time for Europe. In all in all, but especially for Germany, I will f end my talk by highlighting the consequences from this change of an era, which I would like to highlight headline that we will have to face enormous distribution issues. Distribution issues not only when looking at um, government expenditure, but also um, the problem of uh, the division of the distribution with a view on the private economy and social security and the distribution of income and assets. Let me start and for a ch change I will only relate to Germany and I will speak uh, when we look at very short, mm, very low income of the state, we need a much more intensive debate which will come along with a lot of conflicts. What are the state uh, government's priorities for uh, its expenditures? Uh, what is rec recognizable, at least from the point of view of the federal politics, is the, those are the fields of defense, financing the energy transition, promotion of uh, competitiveness of the German businesses, public infrastructure, the promotion of affordable housing, which recognizably uh, has, be has become one of the social um, issues in Germany because uh, many people just cannot find affordable homes and, uh, or can't pay the rent. And also against the background of the aging process in Germany, demographic development, a, a pension system which is also standing up against uh, demographic uh, changes. Those are six or seven areas which leave a little room for maneuver for other areas, although we would have to add education and promotion of technology. And there you can see already 
the recognizable conflicts Germany is in with regard to the use of public spending. Let me just single out one point, all, those, all the other points are also worth mentioning and discussing. This is the uh, competition politics in Germany with a glance to the enormous uh, export orientation of the German industry. This German economic model has been very successful so far, and it, that was the case because the portion of uh, producing industry in the GDP was uh, relatively high, or, and is still relatively high, and the manufacturing uh, industry is very much focused on export. Germany is creating 24% of its annual GDP from this industrial area. The US, in, the US, this, in the USA this is 15%, France 11%, UK 11%, Italy 12%, because they have still a lot of industry in, north, in the north of Italy. At the moment, however, where we are facing raw material issues, energy prices are rising, where we get uh, supply issues, and where there is the need of digitization, which becomes an increasing challenge. At this moment, the strength profile of the German industry with uh, this industry starts to becoming starts becoming very fragile and becomes a weakness of Germany. At least, one would now say, a very vulnerable issue. Because energy prices will remain high, raw material prices will also remain high, supply chains have to be diversified, in particular also when looking at China, maybe also with other Asian states, maybe even in the Middle and Eastern European states. This will lead to a trend where production becomes more and more expensive. So what I explained by mentioning the change of an era has a direct and extreme effect on the German uh, business model. This also is rather ignored in public and uh, very rarely debated in Germany in public discourse. Well, this was just a small excuse. I mentioned the government public spending and the distribution issues caused by that. Secondly, we also have distribution issues when looking at private investments. They also will have to focus much more on the further assurance of economic competitiveness of German industry and what is necessary, what is needed for that development. And by the way, increasingly, this will include the problem of lack of uh, labor in Germany especially skilled labor, not only also when looking at the aging process of Germany. This again will become the central issue um, to a, a well-targeted uh, migration and immigration politics, and when looking at that, the German politics has failed for the last 20 years, and massively, I would now, the third thing, and this is my final statement, is the question of uh, distribution issues with regard to our society. Whereby, in Germany, income distribution is actually not the main issue. This is compensated by a lot of uh, social transfers. But it's a huge problem, not only for Germany, but also in other European countries, not even talking about uh, the US, is the increasing drift in asset distribution. And this is promoted in times of inflation. Who are the big losers of inflation development? Those people who are rather at the lower end of the social pyramid, who only are earning their salaries, and at the same time, they lose purchasing power. And who are the winners in any inflation? Those are the people who have assets, who have material assets. That may be shares or property, real estate, gold. And as soon as prices, in particular for living, are going up, that means that salaries cannot compensate anymore this increase of prices. This drift 
in income distribution and asset distribution will increase and will cause the, as a consequence, the, the uh, social tensions. Uh, the astonishing thing is that uh, in this debate, the haves and the haves not, the haves are not actually understanding what it might mean if these tensions are co continuing to rise. And this goes for the global level as well, between developed countries and countries which try to catch up. And if there is uh, one part in the Marxist theory which I do accept, then it is uh, pointing at the fact that any exaggeration will provoke an antithesis. Each exaggeration will create an antithesis. And each exaggeration also in the development of uh, income and assets in the distribution of, um, of loads and burdens, and when at the same time it affects uh, wider parts uh, of society internationally but also nationally, will provoke a response which may be very irrational, which also may cause the accession to very irrational forces. Uh, at the moment, uh, this uh, more right-wing radical parties are benefiting from this trend rather than the democratic parties. That means, as I think the audience here is actually not uh, pertaining to the have-nots, I try to bring home to you that it is an original interest to deal with these distribution issues in your prof professional activities, whatever they may be, also as one outcome of this change of an era. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Sabir Michael. I'm from Pakistan. And uh, you briefly touched the issue of the uh, migration and immigration facing the German society and a German state. I would not focus on a German state, but rather in a larger perspective, I would like to have your kind attention towards the uh, uh, asylum and immigration issues facing the, especially minorities of the South Asia and especially the Christians in Pakistan. I would just like to mention that majority of the visas of the Christian community in Pakistan is rejected because of the fact that you are going to apply for asylum. But at that same time, the Ahmadi community, the Ahmadi Muslims, they get visa straight away 100%. Why this discrimination is there and how this kind of discrimination can be uh, mitigated or try to be decreased? Because the reason is, I understand asylum is not a right, but declining the visa on a presupposed notion is a great violation and is a discrimination. Your comments, please, sir. Don't, don't blame me. I'm not familiar with this problem and not acquainted with the, these circumstances in Pakistan. Uh, as far as I get it, you wanted to explain that to me, and I, I, I pick it up, but, but I can't give you uh, any, any answer on that. Please, additional questions or comments? Oh, please, of course. Uh, the microphones on the are table are working. As we have a translation, I will ask in German. Thanks for this intellectually very refreshing overall view of the challenges and offering also some solutions. I'm surprised, however, about your surprise that there is no German attention to this subject in order to look at this um, overall picture and to understand the consequences because what you described as a trend in Germany is that we are an agent, uh, aging society and that actually goes hand in hand. What, you, what I understand by aging that um, some is increasingly having difficulties to find one's way in a changing world without the natural order of things which you think um, as a given. And if that is uh, the char characterizing an aging society, it is no wonder that it at the same time when there are major disruptions which are difficult to understand that uh, your um, capability to link uh, certain points and to form a general picture out of that is at least not uh, 
shown in the media and is also an, an intellectual overburdening and uh, it also requires to follow up all these uh, developments. But th this is mm, not very widely developed in Germany. People are not reading the economic part of the mm, newspapers. They also don't follow the geostrategical developments in other parts outside Germany or Europe. At least that certainly goes for the majority. And if then we have such tectonic shifts as you describe, it is indeed already a big achievement to understand in a certain segment what the consequences are. But your uh, conclusion uh, from that is going for far beyond that, including the um, functioning of the European Union and what reforms should be taken in order to come at least closer to a solution. And you mentioned uh, seven points because we, we only gave you that uh, shortness of time, otherwise you might have come up with ten points. So, But how can this be put into an order which can be democratically um, understood? That was rather a frontal kind of question, but I think there is a response from your side to that. Yes, as far as I understood you, I have a different opinion than you. Politics may, of course, uh, demand its audience. You mentioned that that uh, would be too much for the audience and you should not uh, stress your audience too much. But I, th but I think that politics in Germany and the farther parts of Europe is actually not demanding enough from its audience rather than the opposite, which you described. In Germany, in the course of reforms, there have been some activities that have been beginning of the first decade of the Agenda 2010 and Chancellor Schroeder said we should demand and promote. Politics have to do both. They have to promote, but they may also demand their voters up to the question uh, what changes of behavior we need. And uh, in a situation of the change of an era, it is not enough just to put this uh, term into a government speech, but it should also be brought home very clearly to the audience what it means. Uh, that means that it will come along with a lot of adapt adjustment processes which are uncomfortable and unpleasant. Last sentence, the best uh, s summary which a social scientist gave me about the mental situation of uh, Germany is, and I think it's not easy to translate, the Germans want to lean back comfortably in this present situation. What is not possible? Because the present is not standing and holding its place. Germans want to in, in, in install themselves in a comfortable present, but this is now changing. And so it's no use saying that we should not demand too much from our audience or we should not um, be too complex in speaking about the various uh, areas which are on the agenda right away. But we do have to speak about those things. We will have to reduce complexity, but we also have to they have a controversial discussion about that, and this is what I'm missing. Yeah. And then we'll move to the other format of the interview area downstairs. And you can use the microphones here if you prefer. Uh, is it working? Yeah. yeah. If you allow me to ask this question in uh, English, you explain to us the meaning of Zeitenwende, turn of eras, also on, in, in particular in regard to geopolitics the return of geopolitics or the return of power politics. But is it really so that this occurred in 2022? Did it not already incur, occur in a very specific way in 1991 also when President Bush declared the dawn of a new world order and told us that this now will be the era where the rule of law and so on prevails. In actual fact, if we look back these 30 years, it was an era uh, of geopolitics under different circumstances, not under the, uh, under the circumstances of bipolarity. There was no more Soviet Union. It was under the circumstances of hegemony. And there was a number of massive illegal uh, violation, uh, illegal wars, illegal interventions in uh, various parts of the world, 
which has uh, seriously destabilized the global order. So now in 2022, maybe the new aspect is that now it is not a Western power that violates that order, the system of rules. Now it is uh, an, a non-Western power that challenges that predominance of the West in the last 30 years would that not also be an aspect of uh, Zeitenwende? Well, first of all, I agree with you that what we are seeing now has started before. And I'm coming back to this in a minute. I, not, I don't agree with you that it goes back to the speech of Bush Sr. And that, that speech was made under the impression of the implosion of the Soviet Union. And uh, the, let me say, fact that the east-west conflict has come to an end at that point in time. And this, by the way, is was, uh, what Francis Fukuyama meant when he spoke of the end of, the hist of history. I think he was misunderstood for a long time because he meant that historic um, causes came to come to an end. That was not what he meant. He, what he was trying to say is that the competition of systems had come to an end after those war and this indeed was also a change of an era and then there started an era where under the uh, end of the narrative of Fukuyama, we started a normative model in Europe with a clear supremacy of the US and this is also coming to an end now the Western normative model is not there without any competition in the global area and by the way, for some countries, it's never been so attractive. And a certain Western uh, arrogance, a, a certain Western hybris also was thinking that this uh, Western normative model was automatically um, the best th way for other countries uh, which are of a totally ethnic and uh, historic uh, origin. And that's not the case. And that is how some errors in the Western attempt to export the Western democracy model, which failed, especially with some countries which started from a totally different point of, that goes for the Middle East, as for Afghanistan and Mali and other regions. But let me come back to the point where I agree with you. Yes, there is a certain deglobalization which has been going on for six years already. The Russian obsessive imperial mission at least has started uh, since uh, in 2014, but it was not taken seriously then. The rise of China, which comes along with a clear claim that uh, to come at least at eye level with the US, has been recognizable since the pre presidential, uh, since President Xi took power. And the climate change has been recognizable 20 years ago already. That's even not, if not uh, in the 70s already, Meadows. So there is a series of trends where I absolutely agree with you. It's now culminating. It is not uh, coming overnight, but in combination, this now uh, results in a situation where I think that like in 1919, like in 1945, or between 1939 and 45, like 1990, 1990 and 1991, we it, it justifies to speak of a change of an era, but not by going back in a direct line to what we experienced in 1990, 1999 with the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact or the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for all this talk. I'm asking myself, and of course this is a little bit um, mean, but I would like you to answer in three sentences. If the international, if you could choose an international system of states uh, from the blue, like uh, Rousseau starting at uh, ground zero, how would you restructure the United Nations in order to cope with these uh, current crises much better? Because we can see it doesn't work, we can see this in this war, but would be, what would be your proposal in three or four sentences, how we can get there that everything could be more democratic and that we could come to a, a better um, uh, co living together. 
Well, it's impossible. In four sentences, I, you want me to speak about the uh, restructuring of the UN. Give me three or four days and I will not be wiser than others. I never thought about how to restructure the UN. I would be happy to restructure Germany alone. So it's impossible to give you an answer. So presently, we should, I think, focus as Europeans on how to develop the European institutions and the European cooperation. This alone is a central issue and a central task. And speaking about UN, but I think you must have thought about this, and so as an alternative to the restructuring of the UN, you could of course come back to what you said at the end of your talk, that might be food for thought. You said and described that we are giving, we should give up the unanimity, unanimity in our voting procedures at the same time. The signal to Ukraine and other accession uh, countries is that they are not um, accepted and part of the narrative of the German Chancellor is that they do have a perspective that they might be integrated. If the many tasks which you mentioned do not just uh, mean that we have to continue um, ruling, uh, we also will have to deal with other and different societies which would uh, enter the European Union and if the decision-making processes are not reformed by then, it will become even more inefficient. So we will have to deal with a much bigger UN, uh, European Union, which has other tasks, which we want to be more active in financial politics, when we just think of your words about the banking union. So what should the European Union look like? And what kind of European uh, do you have in mind? So I think the one we have been regarding the enlargement, only the Western Balkan states uh, would be a, a real candidate. And this alone is a problem. The question is, if we extend, should we extend the European Union before having a real cooperation within the European Union? I have my doubts about that. I'm far away from uh, seeing the U Ukraine and the European Union. I think it was a capital mistake to grant this uh, status of candidates uh, to, the U to Ukraine in this stage. It's a capital error. I was a member myself in the Committee for Modernization modernization of Ukraine. I was several times in Ukraine and they are far away from becoming an accession state. This is a loan owed to the solidarity in Europe under the conditions of war. But uh, when considering nepotism, the dependence on justice, the bad governance of that country, in my mind it was a capital mistake to um, to uh, give to grant uh, Ukraine something which for many years will not come true and at least as a signal to the Western Balkan states is a highly explosive uh, ex statement because the process of accession with the Western Balkan states has been running for several years and uh, all of a sudden they, le they read in the newspapers that we just throw this status at the Ukraine like nothing. So in a book which I uh, wrote five years ago already I, uh, I wanted to have a, a, a moratorium with regard to accession, and we should open the European only after having had a reform of inter-European cooperation. There were some approaches towards that in order not to extend it to more. My homework for you is that the possibility of so-called enhanced uh, cooperation when 11 or 12 member states of the European uh, um, Union would go ahead as pacemakers, this is a, an approach which should be given much more thought than it is done right now when you can invite the other countries to, call, to, to come in, uh, you are not excluding them. But this enhanced cooperation is one of the possibilities to advance inside Europe without having to take along all the 27. Mr. Steinbrück, uh, thanks you very much for your excellent talk and for the beginning of this discussion. I would now uh, like to have our family photo with the professor and the second part will be done uh, is in the interview, and please. And we have the interview, there's chairs, so you can also listen to the interview there as well. So first, maybe a second round of applause for Chair Steinbrook.